Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. <clears throat> Our guest tonight and I were in the same part of the world at the same time years ago, though we didn't meet each other. Uh, I was at the seminary, she was at the college at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it's a great pleasure to have Sarah Chris Meyer on the program, former evangelical Protestant. Sarah, welcome to The Journey Home. Thank you for having me. And you've been involved with lots of things. They may come up in our conversation. You were um, uh, a founding editor of the Great Adventure Bible Study, mm -hmm. and some of our audience are, I'm sure, familiar with that. And uh, you now teach at St. Charles Borromeo Seminary, right? Yes, Borromeo. Philadelphia. Okay, very good. And a new book coming out, right? Is it already came out? out or? It came out last summer, yep. Okay, Becoming Women of the Word. Mm -hmm. I didn't read that book. You maybe should. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to have you here, Sarah. Let Thank me you. back Thank off you. and invite you to begin us on the journey, if you would. Okay. So I was raised uh, in a very wonderful, warm, evangelical household. Um, I have pastors, evangelists, missionaries going back oh. four or five generations, all directions, aunts, uncles, cousins, everybody are missionaries. And, um, Any particular strand of evangelicalism that most represented in all that group? Or? Well, my mother's family came out of the um, Angelus Temple revival, I guess, okay. back in California, back in the 20s or 30s or whatever, okay. with Amy Semple McPherson. Oh, and all really? That. Yeah. Oh, wow, wow, wow. And uh, wow. they went on to help to start things like Youth for Christ, um, Open Bible Denomination. They okay. were missionaries, evangelists, just all over the world. Wow. Uh, my grandfather worked with Billy Graham. He actually gave him his first job. <laughs> they were good friends till the day they that he died. Wow. Um, preached together. So that's kind of the ilk on that side. And then on my dad's side, they were Quakers. And my grandparents left that and went over to Europe, to Belgium, to be missionaries over there. Wow. So that side of the family is all in Europe. So missionaries all over the place. To me, that just screams the work of grace. Absolutely, yeah. Just grew up uh, in the early years just knowing God's love absolutely positively. Um, my particular family was a little bit different because for the years when I was in middle school, my parents left the faith pretty much, hmm. left the church, um, left going to church. Uh, I guess we prayed. There was one experience in particular. I remember I struggled a lot with nightmares, and I remember the Lord coming to me in my dreams, just mm. reassuring me that he was bigger than anything that could get me. Wow. And so watching over me during those years. Well, um, well that's, that's fascinating. Were, were your parents kind of PKs, you know what I mean? Uh, absolutely, they were, my mother grew up in Sumatra and in Shanghai and her brothers then in Japan and Hong Kong, all over the uh, Asia. And my dad grew up in Belgium. And then they were missionaries. I, I went to a mission school in um, Hong Kong for a couple of years. Wow. And then for health reasons, we had to come back to the States. But well, for the, all that spiritual background, like I said, pastor kids can sometimes, uh, as we read in the Old Testament in the books of Kings, you know, that, that sometimes the children of the parents don't really follow in the footsteps. I mean, I, I, I'm not being critical of your parents, but... Spiritually, you said they left for a while. They, le they left, and then when they came back, we moved to across the country. So I'm in a new high school, and they reverted back and became on fire, pen, um, charismatic <laughs> <laughs> Christians just as I'm entering high school. So that was kind of tough for me. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, you can think you that you're a Christian because your parents are, because your family are. You were raised with the Bible. You're raised with all these good things. But you have to take it on personally for yourself. And um, I struggled a bit in high school and was going kind of down a, a rather a bad path. And um, I'll never forget one day, uh, kind of halfway through high school, I'd gotten myself into a bit of trouble. And I looked at the way I was headed, and I knew that I wasn't headed in the way my parents are, and I thought I'd much rather be like them. <laughs> and I, I prayed, and I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, I need help with my life. You know, will you please fix my life, and if you fix my life, I will follow you. It was very conditional. <laughs> um, but I told him, I said, you know, just to, so you know I'm serious, I'll start reading the Bible, because I hadn't been doing that. I had heard a lot of the Bible. My parents read the yeah. Bible all the time. 
So I started reading the Bible every night and the Lord started speaking to me in the Bible and he grabbed hold of me in places that I needed to be grabbed hold of <laughs> and turned my life around and that started me off on, um, my, on a, a personal relationship with him that just you know grew from that point. Now, so we're, I want to pause there. Yeah. Um, I guess to jump ahead a little bit, but you've been involved with the Great Adventure Bible Study. You're teaching at Charles Borromeo. You've written a book, Becoming Women of the, the Word. Word. And so that bespeaks the fact that your your whole life, in terms of ins inspiration to serve mm -hmm. the Lord, in many ways, the seeds were in the fact that that's how the Lord came to you and awakened you. Absolutely. As you just said, spoke to you. Mm -hmm. Tell the audience what you mean by the fact that the I Lord would spoke love to you. Because a lot of people with backgrounds like me grew up memorizing. You know, you had the sword drills and you memorize every little bit. I was never good with the chapter and verse, but in my in, in our household and in my extended family, the Bible wasn't something to memorize. It was a place to live. And it was a place where you get into and you meet God there and he speaks to you and you hear yeah. him speak into your life and it stimulates prayer. And I guess it was the closest thing that we had to a sacrament. I think it was our sacrament because God's grace poured out to us through his word. And I can't tell you how delighted I was as a Catholic to read Dei Verbum, where it says <laughs> that in the sacred scriptures that the Father who is in heaven comes down with great love to meet his children and speak with them. And that's been my experience. So, uh, In Matthew 6, Sermon on the Mount, when our Lord is talking about prayer, and he says, uh, but when you pray, go into your room mm -hmm. and shut the door. And pray to your father who is in secret. Your father who sees in secret reward you. This is the room. Absolutely, yes. That's why I've always understood yeah. it. This is the room. And from an experiential standpoint, that has become very real for me all my life. Mm -hmm. This is the room. Yeah, I, I disappear into that. And I mean, not every time. It's not always. But... Um, I, I remember coming down stairs if I'd get up early. My dad was always up earlier and he's sitting in his chair with his, you know, a rug over his lap and his Bible in his hand and just lost to the world talking to God. And um, yeah, when, once you know the Lord through the word like that, there's no going back. And you, so there's talking to the Lord through that. Uh, he, hearing him, yeah. So there's that too. You're talking about the fact that you said that as a young Girl, you, in your promise to God, if you bring me back, mm -hmm. all right, um, and to do that, I'll, I'll, I'll read your word. So you're, you're kind of in the footsteps of seeing your dad there in his chair with the, with the blanket mm -hmm. over. But God spoke to you there. Again, go more detail, but how does God speak to us when we, when we open the word and we, and we read to it? You know, when I was 15, he was speaking to me by um, kind of in two ways. One, sort of catching me on things I was doing that I shouldn't be doing. It was sort of instruction and maybe a little reprimanding and so on, but also very encouraging. And um, I just heard it spoken to me. Yeah. But he did, I mean, that dream that I had when I was nine or whatever it was, he came up behind me, wrapped his arms around me, and... The devil was down there trying to get me, and I just knew, I mean, he spoke to me. So I never heard a voice. When I tell you later, though, about my conversion, you'll hear okay. more about him speaking to me. Well, the reason I'm, I'm emphasizing this, and, and we'll, we'll move on now, is because it, it, we really want people to read the Word. Mm -hmm. And and recognize, as St. Fran uh, de Sales says, to recognize that God is trying to speak to mm -hmm. us, just that we don't pay attention, mm -hmm. we don't anticipate it. And uh, when, we, in John 6, when there's this, you know, he, Jesus talks about, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no life within you, and, and most of the people leave, 
And he turns to Peter and the little group, well, what about you guys? And, and, and uh, Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we believed and have come to know. Mm -hmm. That coming to know is hard to put a finger on what we mean by that, but to me that's one of the ways that God speaks in Scripture. You're reading along, and it hits you, and you know mm -hmm. that the Lord is saying, listen to what I'm telling you right now in that yeah. verse. It's a coming to realize, to know that God is speaking to you through this mm -hmm. Scripture. Yeah, the other thing that really had a big impact on me, I think, is growing up hearing jungle stories, <laughs> hearing missionary <laughs> stories. Um, you know, my, my grandparents were in wartime in Asia and in Europe and uh, a lot of upset and difficult times, also being literally in the jungles with various things that happened. And so the stories that they had of, of God's work for, on their behalf and on the behalf of others on the mission field were just remarkable, miraculous. And they were very, very like the stories of the Old Testament. Yeah. So I would read the Old Testament and I'd hear these stories from my, my family and God is the same today as he was then. Yeah. And I knew, I just knew that God could be trusted, that he loved me uh, because of those stories, because of what he's done. So he speaks to us through, through those stories yeah. as well as just through the words. Our guest is Sarah Chris Meyer. So there you are uh, in high school, right? This yep. is when you're, you've... You, Started to come on okay. fire. All My right. dad introduced me to doing word study of the Bible. I love I loved words, love <laughs> word study, really got into it. Um, I was said I was going to go to study medicine in Philadelphia or something, and a, a friend of my my dad's, we were actually up in, in Boston for a wedding, and um, Tom Howard was my dad's oldest, dearest friend. Oh, wow. um, their parents were missionaries together in, uh, in Tom Belgium. Howard, the first guest on the Journey Home program. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very instrumental for me. Yeah. Um, but he said to me, why don't you stay for a weekend at Gordon? I was like, well, okay, I guess. And I... Because at that time, Tom was still Episcopalian. He was, he yeah. was. And he was at Gordon. And I stayed the weekend and I just felt so at home there. I thought, you know what? I'm going to go here. Change my <laughs> life. Um, so went there, threw myself into learning more about the faith. It, they were all about the integration of faith and learning. So any class you took, you know, uh, yeah. So learning, studying the Bible, studying a little bit of theology, philosophy, and so on. But it was a class by Marv Wilson, who was a wonderful Old Testament professor, I took OT, OT theology from him. And that's where I first uh, became familiar with this idea of the biblical narrative, mm -hmm. the Bible story that, of course, we've done in, in Jeff's Bible timeline. Um, but as I read that story of God, I think we read Abraham Heschel, God in Search of Man, and I read in order the, the story of God seeking his people, even when they turned away from him and so on. And I got wrapped up in that story, and then I realized God loves me too. I knew that. I'd always known that. But it just hit me that I was part of this greater story. It was just a, a revolutionizing thing for me. Yeah, the... Uh... It's amazing how we can read it over and over and over again and not see the flow. Yeah. And of course, part of the problem is that on, on Sundays, we get snippets. You get just little chunks of it. Little so. chunks of it. So uh, now the church encourages priests and religious in the office of readings to get a bigger chunk of it over a period mm -hmm. of time, but most Catholics don't get that bigger yeah. chunk. So. Which is why I teach it. That's right. You, you teach scripture there? <laughs> is that what you're teaching at St. Paul? Yes, yep. Yeah. I teach an overview of the scripture. Okay. So. All right. Yeah. So you're at college. You're on, still on fire for your faith? Still on fire for my faith. Everything is going wonderfully. I, um, I fell in love with the liturgy at college at the Episcopal Church there, Christ Church in yeah. Wenham. And uh, when I left college, I wanted to find that same kind of church, and I couldn't find it. Hmm. Um, went into a, several years of just looking for where do I belong. And I think after leaving my parents' home and going out on my own, I started to realize there's a lot of doctrinal differences out there. And <laughs> I have to decide which one, which group of doctrines are true so that I can make my church home there. But I felt this incredible pressure that I had to decide. And I would look to my family and they're in many, many different denominations. 
And you see they sort of agree to disagree on certain things, but some of them are pretty important. Yeah, their, their subtle assumption, I'm assuming, would have been that what church you belong to is not really important. Exactly. What matters is that you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Even a yeah. Catholic can have that. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> um, but things like speaking in tongues. I knew people who thought unless you were born again and spoke in tongues, you're not a Christian. And there were people who thought if you speak in tongues, you're going to hell. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, <laughs> you know, salvation, baptism, these things are big. And um, I just started to have a lot of questions about this sort of thing. And um, the, the kind of, well, it wasn't really a turning point. I took a job where I started to get to know a young man who was cradle Catholic, lapsed Catholic, practicing nothing when I mm. met him. So I would not date him. I said, oh, you're not a Christian. He goes, what do you mean? I'm Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I got to know him better and better. Eventually, he actually had an experience with the Lord, came back on fire for his faith. I had no more excuses. <laughs> <laughs> um, we ended up getting married. Did he hit Returned to the Catholic Church at that no, point? No, no, no. no, no, okay. no. All right. no. So he went to, my grandfather married us in a lovely backyard. And it was, <laughs> <laughs> so um, we got married and after, so we had a child and we went to a family reunion of mine when she was about four months old. And my family reunions on my mother's side are actually missions conferences. There's like <laughs> 200 people and we have timed sessions during the day, the church in India, the church in Afghanistan, the church in whatever. Amazing. I think my husband was a little bit overwhelmed. Um, but at one point, I think there were seven of us cousins who had new babies. And so my grandfather dedicated them all. They had a lovely service and he anointed them with oil and he dedicated them. And afterwards, Mark, my husband was like, he just baptized those babies. I said, there was no water. He didn't baptize them said, I'm pretty sure he just baptized them. I said, no, he did not baptize them. But this got him started to think. Well, let me clarify there. From your perspective, baptism wasn't necessary, wasn't a sacrament. Um, so I had been baptized as an infant, but then I guess my parents changed. All my brothers were dedicated. And then yeah. as teenagers, we were all baptized in a lake by my grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but a believer's baptism. So right. to me... As we were having children, my brothers and I were kind of arguing that question. Do you baptize infants? Do you wait? You know, what is the right thing to do? So I, I thought you have to wait till she can make a declaration for herself that she, she's going to follow Jesus. Then she can be baptized. So Mark's mother, though, thought the baby was going to go to hell if she wasn't baptized. <laughs> so finally, I was like, okay, you know, I, I didn't want I thought it's not going to hurt her. She can always do it again. <laughs> and um, so she was baptized. The, the painful thing to me was that she was baptized Catholic. And um, so you didn't count that thing with with your grandfather doing the anointing. It wasn't that. a baptism. It wasn't a baptism. No. So you... And I convinced my husband of that. Okay. And he's like, well, she's going to be baptized Catholic. I was like, where did this even come from? You know, this was not in our prenup that you would ever be able to look at a Catholic church again <laughs> in your life. <laughs> Um, but he, he started really getting back into it. Um, and the baptism, I came out of that saying, whoa, that was beautiful. Mm. You know, I've never heard that the liturgy was amazing, but Mark got more and more, he's set, he's Catholic again. And, um, he wanted to go to a Catholic church. And I said, I'm not going to a Catholic church. It's like, well, please just go with me one time. So we went, and this is, you know, 30 years ago, whatever it was. The church was, people came in late, they left early, there was terrible music, I couldn't understand the priest, I didn't know what was going on. And we walked out, and I was like, Phew, you know, we will never, ever have to go well, back you again. You weren't, you didn't see angels oh, and inspired? Oh, no, and... maybe devils, I don't know. <laughs> I was so glad to get out of there. And Mark looked at me, and he said, I feel like I've just gone to church for the first time in 20 years. What? It was just, it was devastating because uh, where did that even come from? And he didn't know enough to talk about the Eucharist. He didn't know that was what was drawing him back. He just knew that he was home. Mm -hmm. uh, that was tough. Mm -hmm. So 
how did you respond to that? Did you, did you start going to both churches or did you? So we found, we found a church, uh, it was actually a, a Norbertine Abbey that was not too far from us that uh, it was quite a modern church. There was no, actually, there was no crucifix hanging in the huh. front, which is surprising. No statues, no Mary. Uh, and it, they had a charismatic group on Wednesday nights, the charismatic prayer group. I felt very much at home there. It had beautiful music. The homilies were scriptural. <laughs> you know, it was such a contrast to what I had seen in a few other churches. So I thought, you know what, this is kind of like Christ Church Episcopal. You know, I, I like the liturgy. It's beautiful. The music is beautiful. You know, I can go here. But I knew I couldn't take communion, even though one mm. of the priests told me I could. But um, mm. I knew that I couldn't. So we, we went there for a while. And then uh, our life kind of changed quite a bit. My husband took a job out in Chicago. Uh, we moved to Wheaton, Illinois, which okay. I had a lot of family You've and so on. the center there. of the yep. world. <laughs> and he took a job, but the job did not turn out well at all. And um, not too much longer, we found ourselves, um, the job was awful. We were losing, we had never sold our house back at home. Hmm. We were losing money left, right, and center, could hardly pay our bills. Um, my grandfather died, my mother got cancer. And in the middle of this all, I'm trying to cope with the fact that my husband is more and more Catholic by the day. <laughs> I have no friends because I'm going to a Catholic church. <laughs> and have, it was you, just have awful. You, have you advanced at all with the idea that your husband being, being Catholic is still Christian? Or do no. you still, you're still? No, no. Okay. So, well. On top of everything. I don't think I'd that. really thought of it. And the okay. reason I'm saying no is that. Um, so he was raised going to Catholic school and all, but he never really knew how to articulate anything about his faith. And I would ask him questions. He didn't know anything. He couldn't answer my questions. Uh -huh. And I found there was some really kind priests um, back in Pennsylvania who had talked to me, but I don't think they really understood my questions. Our language was different. Um, I didn't understand their answers. It was, it was very difficult. Yeah. And, you know, all these wonderful Catholic writers weren't, converts weren't writing yet. So it, it was pretty hard. So we get to um, Illinois and our world is falling apart mm -hmm. and I need help. So I heard about RCIA and I said, okay, I'm going here so I can get all the answers and prove to Mark why we can't be Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> that worked out really well. <laughs> okay. Um, well, did you have a good RCIA program? Well, because um, they're not always in those days, particularly they weren't I understand always that. the best. But, yeah. Uh, so my recollection is uh, the first couple of times I went, I came back and I said, Mark, um, I had my list of all, you know, the Pope and Mary and indulgences and all these things that I wanted to ask about. They didn't want to talk about any of them. It's like, who's God? Who's Jesus? You know, why do we need a savior? I said, Mark, they're Christian. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, duh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, so I kept going. And the next thing that was really um, meaningful to me was when they talked about the sacraments of initiation. And by this time, we were having a second child trying to decide, are we going to baptize this one Catholic or not? <laughs> and when they explained them, I thought, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. This is what I have always believed. It just struck a chord in my heart that this is true. And I was... As I explained all about earlier, grace. and, and I was yeah. well, and also just the way you enter into God's family. It doesn't matter if you're saying yes or no yet. You know, the family is bringing you in, and then what yeah. confirmation is, and uh, it was just, it was true. Yeah. I knew it was true, <laughs> and just the thought that oh, maybe I don't have to decide all this stuff by myself. You know, maybe there's mm -hmm. some kind of authority there. Uh, these were very half-formed thoughts, but. That was a turning point at where I thought, oh, maybe I'll find out more about this for myself, not just to prove that it's wrong. So I went there for a while and then kind of backfired because we had a time when um, the open mic, you know, you can come and ask any questions that you want. And most of the class was there because they were getting married. And so they had all these questions about contraception which I didn't even know was an issue. And I thought I was in the wrong night, you know, in the wrong class. 
But um, the priest explained Humanae Vitae, I guess he was reading from, and then he sat down and he said, but you know, that's how they do things in Rome and here in America, we do things a little differently. And this is a very private thing between you and your spouse and the Holy Spirit, and you need to just pray about it and, you know, the Holy Spirit will show you. Mm -hmm. And I was floored because how's that not Protestant? I mean, yeah. I raised my hand. I was like, excuse me, I am a Christian. I love Jesus Christ with all my heart. I am here to find out whether I should be Catholic. And as far as I can tell, one of the differences is that you've got some authority in matters of faith and morals. I'm sure I didn't say it like that. Um, and now you're telling me that I can just ask the Holy Spirit what's right and follow that. I said, I do that already. <laughs> you know, this, this sounds very Protestant to me. And I just, I was so upset. I was shaking. I was so upset. And I just walked out. I said, I'm wow. done. I am not going back. So our life situation continued to deteriorate and we ended up moving back home and living with my parents because things were so bad. Hmm. And, um, but in between then, so I just, this was all, all consuming to me. It was so distressing and I felt like um, I had nowhere to stand anymore. I used to feel like I was on really solid ground and it was all falling away. And here there was the beauty of the, you know, the, the things, some things I was learning, but then what is this church that, you know, I was very confused and it was, I had nowhere to turn. You know, um, so I think we'll pause there because, I mean, it, it, to me, it's fascinating. I hear stories all the time, of course, mm. but it's what you, what was happening is when you realize the significance of the church as the pillar and bulwark of the truth, mm -hmm. as Scripture says mm -hmm. in First Timothy, um, that when you're, when you're confronted with the, the aberration of it, when a priest who should be defending that very thing mm -hmm. says, nah. Yeah. What do you do with that? Well, what do you do? Because, yeah. and you can't just go back, you, you, in other words, you can't just okay, well, then that's wrong. I'll go back to what I was because you already discovered there's something wrong mm -hmm. with where you were. You always you already discovered that personal interpretation has a flaw in it. Yeah. So you just can't go back. And you, you can't, <laughs> and where can't. are you going to go? And then the ground's falling out under you. And how do you stand? And then on top of that, my marriage. So here's my husband who's every day, he's a more solid Catholic and he doesn't care what I do. I mean, he's like, you go over to the Presbyterian church or whatever you want to do. Uh, this is what I'm doing. So he wasn't putting any pressure on me. He also wasn't answering any questions. But I thought, how can I be in a marriage where my husband is doing this and I'm doing that? And it was, yeah. it was terrifying. And to me, I could certainly see that another, the reason why it was a problem, because it, it, you took this seriously. Yes. You took this seriously. It's not enough for you to say, well, that, that didn't work and I can't go back, so I won't, just won't be involved at all. Because oh, you, I you wouldn't took, have occurred to me. It wouldn't yeah. occur to you because this, the word, the, the reality of God, the reality of our Lord Jesus, so it was just too serious. Yeah. And uh, that ain't a quali uh, you know, uh, an option to set mm -hmm. aside. Okay, mm -hmm. let's pause there then, and we'll come back in a moment. Our guest is Sarah Christmeyer, and we'll continue with her story in just a moment. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi. Our guest is Sarah Christmeyer. And before we go back to the story, I just want to remind you about uh, my work with the Coming Home Network and our website, chnetwork.org. You just heard Sarah talk about what we call in our work the no man's land. And that's when somebody who has come from another Christian tradition discovers the Catholic Church, but gets stuck, if you will. They, mm -hmm. they, they they really can no longer just go back, but they can't yet go forward. And so we call it no man's land. And if by chance you're one of those that 
has seen the beauty of the church, but you're just not, for whatever reason, ready to move forward, we'd love to hear from you. If you go to chnetwork.org, you'll see lots of conversion stories, but we'd love to help you discern your next step of the journey. That's chnetwork.org. All right, Sarah, let me, let me allow you to return to your journey. So there you are, and, and you say it's even have a, a difficult impact on your marriage during that time. Yeah, I was, I was very concerned about that. And um, in that my family being the way it was, Mark was really a fish out of water there. He could not hold his own. He couldn't talk scripture, with, which is what we all talked about. <laughs> um, he was just a fish out of water. And I thought in our family, I always ended up being the one who would lead. And I thought, here, we're having children. Am I going to be like the spiritual head of the family? I can't do that. You know, my husband needs to be that. So I was just in a really a, a very awkward place and a difficult place about that. And I spent a lot of time in prayer. I was also in prayer because we had no money. And as I said, my grandfather had died and my mom had cancer and we're in this I have no friends and nowhere to go. So my dad's very good friend, uh, Tom Howard, who you know, was a guest on this show many years ago. He, I started calling him and asking him some questions. And one day he sent me a tape. It was actually an audio cassette tape, if you remember those <laughs> back in the day. Um, and it was Kimberly Hahn's conversion story. I think uh -huh. she had just become Catholic. <clears throat> and he said, you know, I think you might want to listen to this. So I listened to it, and Kimberly had a very similar background to mine, and she talked about yeah. the fear that she had. <clears throat> Excuse me. She talked about the incredible fear, and that's all I remember, frankly, about her story is her talking about the fear, and I thought, somebody else out there is like me. I am not the only person you know, in the universe who is having this problem. And I called her, and she very graciously talk to me for hours on several occasions. And um, I think she got kind of frustrated with me, actually, <laughs> with the, the questions that I had. But I, I'll never forget, at one point, she said, Sarah, you know, did you have everything figured out, all your theological questions answered as a Protestant? I'm like, no. She just kind of let that sink in for a little bit. <laughs> and she's like, how are you going to have everything answered, you know, to decide if you should be Catholic or not? And I remember, I don't remember if I said this to her, but I definitely thought it, wrote it in my journals. If only I could be sure that it was really a Christian church, mm -hmm. then I could become Catholic. And then my husband and I would be on the same path. And then God could turn us around. <laughs> Maybe if he wanted to. <laughs> um, so uh, one night I was just in a, a great deal of anxiety and I was praying and praying. And uh, I felt the Lord speak to me. I was not reading the Bible, but he spoke to me. And he said, Sarah, who brought you here? And I just suddenly realized that, oh, might it be possible that God brought me here? <laughs> and that was, I was really upset with that because why would God bring me to this terrible place? So I railed at him for a while, got it all out of my system. I was quiet. And then it was like I was in this green field and his hand stretched out to me and he said, I'm going this way. Are you coming? And it just was such love and not like if you don't, you're going to go to hell or anything like that. Just, you know, maybe there's a greater plan here that you don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> and um, if there was anything that I was taught, it was that if God asked you to do something, you do it. And my great fear, actually, and my prayer growing up was that, God, please don't send me to Africa to be a missionary. <laughs> you know, I don't want to be in the jungles like my parents and grandparents were. Um, I would not do very well in the jungles. So he sent me to a very different kind of jungle. <laughs> that reminded me when I was in seminary, we used to joke that, that verse in, I think it's Isaiah, where, you know, who will go for me? And we used to say, here I am, said Fred. That's you know? right, that's right. Because <laughs> I knew what, what you could get into, you know, on the mission field. And um, it had not occurred to me that God would actually send me into the Catholic Church. Um, but I felt that as a call. I felt that as a call, and I thought that I should be obedient to that call, but I was not excited about it. Um, uh, it, it was awful, actually. Um, so about this time, we moved back to the East Coast, 
And uh, I was living with my parents because my mother was ill. And I went to an RCIA group there. And I don't really remember much about that group. I suppose I had a sponsor. I don't know who it was. <laughs> um, we had to get remarried, which was another thing because my grandfather had married us. And oh, what? You know, that didn't count. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but the deacon who led us through that process, he did it, we were speeding things up to make it by the Easter vigil. So he met with us, just the two of us, and it was wonderful. Mm. Um, and then, uh, the, but the time the, at the Easter vigil when I became Catholic, uh, it's a very black picture in my mind because emotionally I felt like I was jumping off a cliff. Um, mm. I remember my poor mother was in bed with a migraine for a few days. Um, it was, it was, uh, I wasn't excited about it. And I, I was doing it out of obedience. God, you want me here? Okay. So after that, we moved again. And um, I didn't really have friends that I could talk to. I didn't have um, my, my family I couldn't really talk to anymore, and they were my close confidants and spiritual support, and that was gone. Um, Tom Howard, bless his soul, you know, he, he sent book after book after book, <laughs> and I started reading everything I can get my hands on, you know, Frank Sheed and Thomas Aquinas, and the Catechism had just come out. I read that cover to cover, and very gradually light started to come on for me because oh, I, I thought if I'm going to be Catholic, I got to understand this. You know, I need to know what is it that I believe now? <laughs> you know, what what does the church teach? And that was exhilarating yeah. as I um, and that feeling that I had over and over again that maybe not so much. This is what I've already believed, but it just felt so right. Yeah. And then the most astonishing thing was reading scripture came alive in a new way. I always thought it was alive. And it, it, the, the connections were deeper. They were more powerful. Um, I, I explained it like I, for years, I still refuse to wear glasses unless I have to. But I got a <laughs> pair of glasses and I put them on and I said to my husband, the trees have leaves on them. And that's how I felt. It was like the Bible, I can see it in, in such greater depth and richness of color. Um, which opened up uh, such a, a deeper, richer aspect of my faith that was really wonderful. And I was part of a Bible study at the time, a community Bible study, which is a really wonderful mm -hmm. women's Bible study. And I started, you know, it's community Bible study, so you're supposed to look at a lot of different denominations, and, you know, you should at least consider them all. Well, apparently Catholic isn't really included in that. <laughs> and as I would try to bring up different things, because I was a leader in the Bible study, um, it just got really uncomfortable for them and for me. And so one day I went to my pastor and I said, you know, I really want to study the Bible with Catholics. I want to share with them what I want, what I know, and I want to show how glorious the Bible is. Because what the, the part I didn't say was when I became Catholic, um, the cultural difference, first of all, being in Philadelphia, all Irish and Italian Catholics, and I'm as wasp as they come, um, <laughs> they're very kind, you know, nice, but I didn't fit in. I didn't go to the right schools. I didn't go to the, I didn't root for the right teams. You know, I didn't <laughs> have the right parish or whatever. I didn't fit. And they didn't understand me. And the only way I knew to practice my faith with other people was to open the Bible. And they weren't opening the Bible. And I was like, well, a rosary, what's that? You know, how do I, it was just so lonely and isolating and um, such a culture shock. I remember sitting at mass and being just mesmerized by the liturgy of the word and the beauty of the way the scripture connects through it and, and oh, so powerful. And I'd look around and I'd be like, why isn't anybody else excited? You know, why, why are you guys not just eating this all up? And then about the time the Liturgy of the Eucharist would come up, which I didn't quite understand yet, I would sort of set back and, you know, try to be interested and everybody else would perk up. And, you know, it was just, it was a very, um, it was very lonely, very difficult. So can I start a Bible study, please? And 
beautiful. My, my pastor let me do it. And um, he said, you know what? I bet you'll get a half a dozen people. That ought to be enough, won't it? So I put out the word, 80 people signed up for that Bible study, <laughs> 80 people. So I started this and um, I thought, well, if there's 80 people, we have to have small groups. So I picked a handful of people who were faithful people and I met with them on a different day because we'd have to go through the whole lesson ahead yep. of time. I had to teach them how to facilitate a small group, how to answer tough questions. We prayed for our groups. I had to teach them all the background of the scripture that we were <laughs> studying. Um, but it was a wonderful, wonderful group of people that I worked with. Uh, and then the I could only find very little Catholic Bible study material. So we I had started with Matthew and um, that, you know, this just isn't going to work because I want to really get into scripture. And this Bible study is read a commentary and talk about how it impacts your life. <laughs> so I just started writing my own, uh, started writing my own Bible study material, which I can't believe my priest let me do that. But <laughs> <laughs> there actually was a priest who came along uh, who was there every week and helped me with my wow. teaching ability when to, anyway teaching skills. I was really nervous to get up in front of people, but I wrote questions every week. People had to do their homework. They'd come in, we'd have the small group, and then I'd give a talk every week, week after week. I did that for, I don't know, eight or 10 years or something. But all the time, just studying every Catholic thing that I could get a hold of, because I knew, I remember my dad actually said to me one time, he goes, you know, make sure you just don't turn them into Protestants. You know, you've mm -hmm. got to read, you're Catholic, you know. He, he, was, he was wonderful at encouraging me on, on my journey. But trying to figure out, okay, so what does Catholic Bible study look like? How is it different from mm -hmm. Protestant Bible study? It's going to be different, you know, just exploring all of that. And then at that point, I reconnected with somebody who you know. She's actually been on this show, Gail Summers. Mm -hmm. I had known through the Howards when I was at Gordon. And Loveless said, Howard said to me one time, you should connect with Gail Summers because she's doing exactly what you're doing out in Phoenix. So I called her, we talked for hours, decided to pool our resources because it's a lot of work mm -hmm. doing all of that. And um, we began working on writing Bible studies together. And we were trying to make sure that it was a truly Catholic Bible study. And I uh, worked very hard on just getting, getting it right. And then we wanted to get it published. And she took it around to a lot of publishers who said, Catholic publishers who said, there's no need. There's no market. There's, we got a couple Bible studies out there. You know, that's it. So we heard that Scott Hahn and Jeff Cavins and I think Mark Shea, and I forget who else were involved, they were doing something called At Home with the Word. And it was an internet Bible study, just material out there. And I think it might have been mostly for pastors who were converting or for, mm. you know, real scripture nerds, the few that were there among Catholics who wanted to know <laughs> <laughs> what, what does the Bible teach about, you know, how, how does the Bible and Catholic teaching fit together and so on. But it was wonderful stuff, but way over the head of the average parishioner. Mm -hmm. So we approached them. We went to Steubenville one year and met with them. And, you know, between us, we have X number of years of teaching Bible study experience. Can we work together and do something for parishioners? And so started working with them, and it actually ended up becoming Catholic Scripture Study now international, yeah. which Gail Buckley has right. has taken it to that. Um, but a, a little ways into that, um, I I was involved in my I was on parish council, and we had these clusters of parishes, and we needed a speaker, and I wanted to bring in somebody who would be really wonderful and preferably biblically based. And I said to Jeff Cavins one day. You know, you speak, don't you? You sure you have, would have something that you could say? <laughs> this. And he says, I got this thing that's called the Bible timeline. You know, sounds good to me. Why don't you come? And so we had we had Jeff come, and um, there's like four parishes there, and I brought 30 or 40 people from my Bible study to that one day seminar, Bible timeline seminar, and I was just dumbfounded. I was like, Jeff. 
this is the missing link for Catholic Bible study. <laughs> He's like, why do you think I do it? <laughs> um, but what I saw with my group was that they, having seen that big picture, if you don't know mm -hmm. what the Bible timeline is, it gives you the big picture of salvation history and how the Bible tells that story so that you can understand the bits and pieces that you get, you know, while you're at mass or whatever. When they heard that story, they got so excited, but they came back and they were like, uh, we can't remember all this, teach it to us again. <laughs> so the next week we got together and I just, I knew it all. I just, the way he put it together was very novel. And, um, so I did that and taught it to them. And then I went to Jeff and I was like, can we like build the Bible study program should be built on this and so on. And it was, we were very much thinking along the same lines, which <laughs> was wonderful. And he had just uh, switched over to work with Ascension Press who was in, they were in my backyard. Mm -hmm. So I said, could I please work with you on this? So uh, we both kind of left the Catholic scripture study and started working with Ascension to bring the Bible timeline to the Catholic world, which was very, very exciting. So it's called such the a, Great Adventure Bible Study. The Great Adventure, yeah, it wasn't a Bible study yet. It was a, it was a seminar. All right. So we built the Bible studies based on that. It was a real whirlwind. Um, but that it has been uh, given me such a privileged position from which to watch how getting to know the Lord in Scripture has just set people, Catholics, on fire yeah. for their faith yeah. in a really wonderful way. Appreciating the great gift we've always had. Mm -hmm. And here are snippets of it. I mean, uh, often converts mm -hmm. say, who didn't think Catholics were scriptural before, realize mm -hmm. that in the Mass, Catholics hear more scripture than any Protestant worship service yep. over a long period of time. But because they hear it in snippets, they do have the life of Christ over the year as the guide mm -hmm. for the liturgical selections of readings. But they don't often catch the bigger picture mm -hmm. as, as you and Jeff have portrayed it, uh, have demonstrated in The Great Adventure. Um, talk about your new book, Becoming Women of the Word. I mean, mm. it's one thing to get Catholics excited about the, it's important. Mm -hmm but now specifically women. Yeah. Um, so I always have wanted to help people to understand the love that God has for them and also to know that God can be trusted. Mm -hmm. And one of the things in the Bible timeline that, you know, that comes across, if you study the Bible from the beginning and you start looking at, so how did God reveal himself through time to people. Mm -hmm. And you watch those steps of faith. You know, how did Abraham grow in faith through his life? And how did God reveal himself, you know, deeper and deeper through the years? Um, there's a lot that we can learn from those, those stories. And I had been um, toying with the idea of, of writing a book about women of the Bible of the Old mm -hmm. Testament for some time. Because in as we walk our way through, especially when you're focusing on the covenants, you, you're focusing on Abraham and Moses and David and pretty much the men. Well, there's women in those stories and they have a role, but we kind of bypass them a little bit. But the fact is, you know, God started with a couple and his plan is worked out in a rather complimentary way. You might say we've got the woman and her seed, you know, in Genesis and we've got Mary and Jesus. And there are all these women in the Old Testament who kind of pave the way for Mary and who paved the way for the woman and her seed and for conquering the devil and all of that. So I wanted to bring out that. And they also have wonderful stories and they're told in great detail and we can learn a great deal about what it means to walk in faith and who we are as Christians, whether we are male or female. We come from not just Abraham, but also from Sarah. And there's aspects that we can learn from their stories as to what it means to be people of God and, and people of faith and so on. So I started with the idea of just writing about these women of the Bible. And then I thought, you know what? What made me, what made these come alive to me? And the reason that I can trust that God is still like that is that I saw that in my own life and in my family's life. Mm. So I took each woman, as I go through, I paired with a woman from 
who had been instrumental in my faith life. Uh, so my mom's in there and my both of my grandmothers and some okay. aunts and uh, some, some others uh, who are not related. Um, but I, I would tell a story from their life that would have a similar theme to the theme that I was drawing out about the woman. Mm-hmm. And it was all about how do we learn what it, what it means to walk with God? What does it mean mm-hmm. to answer his call? What does it mean to follow him? So that is, that is my book. And um, Excellent. hopefully a tribute not only to those women of the Old Testament, but also to those in my family. All right. That book's Becoming Women of the Word. Um, you know, as I, th- I think about drawing our, our discussions to a close, there's so much we can talk about, but um, it's possible that there are people watching this program who are now where you were. And um, specifically, I'm thinking about the fact that you come from a tradition where um, you have a, a long line of people who truly love Jesus Christ, mm-hmm. who were touched by his grace, who knew God, who loved the scriptures, uh, but yet didn't seem to have a sense about a need to become Catholic. Mm-hmm. A lot of folk, but they love Christ, they love yep. scripture, they love that. And so sometimes the question is, well, if I have all that, why do I need to be Catholic? What would you say to them? Why make the same journey you've made? Why? Because mine, I got, I didn't make it on an intellectual basis, but I'm so glad to be Catholic. It has brought me a stability. Um, it also has brought me, I love your name, The Journey Home, because I felt like I came home. You can go to church anywhere in the world and just feel part of this body. But the certainty that you get with the the, church, the magisterium is phenomenal. I, uh, that has made a big difference in my life. And then knowing that Jesus is present in the Eucharist, um, that's not something that's easy to articulate, but being able to be in his presence and to see something, to eat it, to have him in you that way, um, yeah. how, how could you ever go back after that? I don't know. But I don't feel like I have to convert everybody. I'd like to show them the beauty. Um, yeah. And which is really what our, our Pope Francis has called us to do. He says, make sure that your witness matches your life. Mm-hmm. Your words got to match your life. And that's what, all we can do is yeah. we can tell about the beauty we've discovered, but we really do have to show it mm-hmm. too. And uh, I think for me, one of the things, again, back to the study of the word, as a, as a non-Catholic Christian, I love the word. I love my Lord Jesus. And, and, and I don't mean this to sound critical of, of our non-Catholic Christians' scripture studies, but there was a sense in which when I was, I realized by looking back that my study of scripture was very thin and flat. Mm-hmm. You know, I understood scripture but was very thin and flat. Becoming Catholic, especially through seeing it through the catechism, the depth of it. Yeah, I imagine that might offend people if you told them that, though. But it it, it is true. That's what we've come to it discover. Yes, I was flabbergasted by that. Yeah, I remember there's a great famous Protestant scholar uh, who used to say when he studied scripture, he'd have the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. And that's the way to understand the word. Wow. You know, you've got the Bible and the newspaper. Mm -hmm. So you interpret it in your life. Especially if it's Revelation that you're studying. Yeah, the Bible (laughs) and the newspaper. For Catholic, it's the Bible and the catechism. Mm -hmm. You know, you you have the tradition, the church that helps you put it into the right context in the historical context. Um. A website, comeintotheword.com, yes. what would they find? What would they find? Um, my blog, uh, uh, inviting people into the Word, helping them do that, uh, resources for, for a scripture study and so on as a Catholic. Um, yeah. All right. Sarah, thank you so much. Thank you very For sharing much. your journey and also all your work. I mean, uh, you know, one of the struggles that sometimes converts have when they come into the church is how do I use all the gifts and spirits and training that I had before now that I'm into the church? Well, there's <laughs> plenty of room. We need a lot of workers. <laughs> yeah, the Lord didn't let you skip a beat. So yeah. thank you very much. And as I close, one more mention about Coming Home Network. So many times, Sarah, you mentioned that you felt very alone during mm-hmm. that transition time. You, 
Protestants, you didn't have, you were losing friends and you didn't know yeah. any Catholics. Well, that's one of the reasons we established the Coming Home Network, which we could have been there for you back in those yeah. days so that you can connect with others who've made the journey, uh, going through the same struggles, even the same loneliness. Uh, one of the reasons we jokingly said about the Coming Home Network, a lot of people who become Catholic realize, wow, instead of coming individually, we could all come on the same bus. <laughs> you know, that's the point of the fellowship of the Coming Home Network. So if there's a way we can help you, please connect with us at chnetwork.org. So God bless you. Look forward to seeing you again next week.